With our rate laws, we saw relationships between rates or speeds of reactions and concentrations. We learned how to develop the equations that relate concentration to rates. What we're going to look at in this lesson is starting to look at time and concentration, okay? When you know how fast you're traveling, you know how much time it takes you to get from point A to point B. With integrated rate laws, we're going to figure out how much time it takes to make a concentration go from this value to this value. So we're going to look at it first, what an integrated rate law is, and we're going to look at it for first order reactions, and then we'll look at second and zeroth order relation, uh, relationships later, okay? So that's what I said. What we're going to be able to do with these integrated rate laws is determine how much time it takes to get you um, from point A to point B, okay? So the simplest cases, there's three simplest cases. There's first order, there's second order, and there's zeroth order overall. And this is the overall order of these reactions. We can get more complicated. Um, we will not in the scope of this course. So focus only on first order kinetics in this lesson. What do we know? Here's our reaction we're going to study. A reactant turns into product. Okay, so it's got a coefficient of one, it's some reactant turning into products. This is what we know so far about this already based upon what we've learned at this point. We know that this would be true because I told you we are studying first order. And if it's first order, it's raised to the first power. So we know that this rate law would apply to that reaction. We also know that this is true. Okay, it has a coefficient of one in front of the A, so the rate could be determined in t terms of A by the negative of the change in concentration of A over the change in time. Okay, so we have two different ways of coming up with the rate of the reaction. The top one is called the rate law. The second one is the definition of rate, the rate expression in terms of the change in concentration. Now, both of these should be able to give you the same rate because they're for the same reaction. So you can set them equal to each other, okay? Now, this right here and a little bit of calculus will get us to our next equation. For those of you who've had calculus, you could try to derive this next equation. But calculus is not a prerequisite for this course. So I'm going to do a little hand waving and take you to that next equation. The natural log of A over A naught, that's how I will say it, A with a little zero, is equal to a negative KT. This is the integrated, because it took integration to get to it, integrated rate law for a first order reaction. That's all it is, okay? That's all it applies to. Now what do we have here? We've got some things we'll define as we go around this equation. When you see that A naught, we're saying this is my initial concentration. This is at time equals zero. This is at the beginning of the trip, okay? That's what A naught is. Then you've got, okay, I've traveled this far. This is where I am in the reaction. That A is the value of concentration at some time, okay, time of T. Um, we can take, of course, of course, that K is our same rate constant for that reaction. Of course, T is time. Now, what have I done here? If you take the natural log of a quotient like that, that is the same as the natural log of A minus the natural log of A naught. Hopefully, you can reach back in your mind of uh, algebra and remember that relationship there. And the only reason, so you could learn it either way, either in the top form or the second form. And then I'm gonna do a little rearranging. And I, there's a reason for this, okay? What have I rearranged? All I've done is rearranged a little bit here to um, put the A naught over on the right hand side. That's it, okay? And I've done a little grouping. I put some parentheses around the minus K. Why did I do that? I have put this equation into the slope-intercept form of a line, y equals mx plus b, okay? So uh, that top equation is a linear graphing. If I were to plot the natural log of a along the y-axis and along my x-axis I had time, I would get a straight line with a slope value given to me there.
okay? The slope is in parentheses, that's my m, and it would be equal to a negative k. We'll look at that graph here in a little bit. But that's all I've done there is taken this one equation. We love straight lines. Straight lines are our friend, and we can get this as a nice straight line um, and be able to actually obtain a value of k from the data. So here is your seeing plot of concentration versus time on the left. That's not a straight line. That's an exponential decay right there. On the right hand side, when you're plotting natural log of A versus time, you do get a straight line. Notice the slope. It's a negative slope there. It's going off to the down and to the right. That is a negative slope. So the slope of that line is equal to a negative K. One of the things that you're going to need to know as we proceed through here is what would you have to plot in order to get a linear graph for each one of these orders. So right now, for first order, we know we would have to plot natural log of concentration versus time. We'd get a straight line with a negative slope. Okay. Now, how do you get the slope from a line? If you're doing the graphic work and you've plotted out on a piece of paper, you can take two points on the line. Okay, now notice it's not two data points. The line is the best straight line through those points. It's not a connect the dots. All of them seem to be on the line here, but they may or may not be. They may be staggered a little bit on and off the line. You find the best straight line through those points. And you take two data points on that line. And a slope is the change in y over the change in x. So you pick two data points, and you read down on the graph what are the y values, what are the x values, plug them in. You would get a slope. If it's first order kinetics, the unit for k is always 1 over time. Okay, that's always going to be its units when it's first order. The natural log of concentration has no units. So when we change in y over change in x, the x has got the time in it and it's in the denominator. The other way you can do it is you can do it with Excel. You can put those data points in there and with a stroke of a button, you can know the equation of the line. It'll spit out for you the slope y equals mx plus b, and you can know it directly from that graph. Okay, now we said this for rate laws, or when we did a change in concentration over time. It's also true um, here as well. Because of the proportionality between concentration and pressure of a gas, PV equals nRT, I'm going to prove that to you really quickly here. PV equals nRT. T. As long as we're doing the experiment with constant temperature, if I take the V over here, P equals moles over liters. Moles per liter is molarity, okay? If we're doing experiments at where the temperature is being held constant, this is a constant, that tells me that pressure and the moles over volume is going to be proportional to each other, then you can replace those concentrations with pressures. Plot y equals mx plus b, natural log of pressure along the y-axis, time along the x-axis, and again, you would get this, a uh, straight line and obtain a rate constant. Rate constant would once again be in 1 over concentration. Um, this doesn't work for every order, but it works very nicely for first order. All right, so there, there it is. It's just a plot of natural log of pressure versus time, showing you that same straight line, showing you you can obtain a slope of that line and get the k value from it. All right. When we talk about speeds at which reactions take place, one of the things that we use as a measure of the speed is something called the half-life. So we're going to look at half-life for a first order kinetics. We're going to derive the equation first, okay? Well, first we're going to define it. What is half-life? Half-life is the time it takes to consume half of your reactant. So drop the concentration into half of what it was. However much time it takes to cut it in half is called the half-life. So we have a way of writing that. The half-life is T with a sub 1 half is the point at which the concentration, A, is equal to one half of where you started. Take what you started with, cut it in half. However much time it takes to do that is a half-life. 
So if we start with our equation for first order kinetic, kinetics, which looked like this, Nash log of A over A naught is equal to minus KT, and take the information in the line above and plug it into that line, all you are doing is a substitution. So in place of the A, we're putting one half A naught. Okay? So in place of the A's concentration, we put one half A naught. And in place of the T, we put T one half. Then a substitution. Now, do you see anything canceling? Yes. The A naughts would cancel, and you'd have the natural log of one half is equal to minus KT. Why don't I just go ahead and cancel that, right? I will put a line through each one of those. Now, the next scene that we see, it seems a little bit strange. It has a 2 instead. And, but notice that the my minus went away, okay? The natural log of 1 half and change the sign would be the same as the natural log of 2. And then we continue and solve for the 1 half, t 1 half, and we have this equation. This equation, I'm going to put a box around it. It is a handy little equation. When do we use it? When we want to know the half-life of a first-order reaction, we will pull that equation out, and that will give us the half-life if we know the rate constant. Now, what is interesting about this equation is that it's totally independent of what the concentration is. It doesn't matter. The amount of time it takes uh, something to go from 5 million, no, let's pick an even number, from 8 million to 4 million, for the same reaction would take it from 8 to 4. It doesn't matter whether it's a whole bunch or a little bit. The amount of time it takes to cut it in half is the same amount of time regardless. This is true only for first order kinetics. Half-life is totally independent with by how much you have, okay? And that's what I just stated. It doesn't matter how much you start with. So here is that graphically. We start out with a whole lot. Okay, up there at the top, that's my initial amount. And let's count how many we have in there, okay? 2, 4, 6, 8, 10, 12, 14, 16 maybe? <laughs> 2, 4, 6, 8, 10, 12, 4. I think they're supposed to be 16. Yeah. So whether there are or not, there's 16. So if we're going to cut that in half, we go down to 8. There's going to be a certain amount of time it takes to do that. It's calling that a time interval. Let's give it a time. Let's say it took an hour to get there. All right, and then going from 8 to 4 would take me the same hour. To go from 4 to 2 would take me the same hour, okay? One hour. And then if you'd go from 2 to 1, that would take one hour. If it's a molecule, we can't go to half a molecule, but if each one of those represents a mole, then we could go to half a mole and fourth of a mole. But eventually you're going to get down to one molecule and it's going to disappear, okay? So it doesn't go on forever and ever, but it is totally independent of how much you have. Okay, so let's think about this problem. I have a first order reaction, so I know that the half-life is not dependent upon the amount. It's a first order reaction. I'm starting with an initial concentration of, and I'll call that A initial of 8 molar, okay? It tells me it has a half-life of one minute T one half equals one minute. And it wants to know what's going to be the concentration after three minutes. I want you to stop, work your way through that logically, and find your answer. Did you pick one? Okay, this is how I would have done that. Three minutes is three half-lives. One minute's one half-life, so three minutes is, is three half-lives. I'm going to cut 8 in half three times. So 8 cut in half once is 4. Cut in half a second time is 2. Cut in half a third time. This is the first half-life. This is the second half-life. This is the third half-life. And that gets me down to 1. So when you know what the half-life is, you can figure out how much you'd have remaining by seeing how many half-lives is that, as long as it's a, um, a direct multiple of that, okay? If I said how much is going to be remaining after two and a half minutes, now you can't do it that way. But as long as it's a multiple of this, then you can just cut it in half as many multiples as you need to. All right, let's look at this problem. First order reaction. It tells me what the rate constant is, okay? So in this problem, they're not giving me the half-life. They're giving me K. I'm going to make my pen work a little bit better here. Bear with me. All right, so K 
is equal to 3.0 times 10 to the minus 3, and that's seconds to the minus 1, or 1 over seconds. It wants to know the time required for the reaction to be 75% complete, okay? If it was half complete, that would be one half-life. If it's 75% complete, well, the first half-life, you use up half of it, you have half remaining, the next half-life, you're going to use up a fourth of it. 75% complete is 25% remaining, or one-fourth. So one thing we can do with this problem is knowing that 75% complete is two half-lives. Now that might not have clicked with you. You might want to back up and hear that again. 75% complete is 25% remaining. The first half goes away after the first half-life, then half of that gets me down to a quarter, and that would be 25% complete. That would be two half-lives. It wants to know how much time that would take. Well, I don't know the half-life yet. So I take 0 0.693 divided by k, and I will get the half-life. I've got the k value, so the value for this one is going to be 231 seconds, okay? So it's going to take two half-lives in order to be 75% complete, so that would be 462 seconds. Now let's imagine for just a moment that you never noticed that 75% complete is two half-lives. You can do this problem without knowing that, and here's how. We know it's first order kinetics. So we know the natural log of A over A naught is equal to minus K times T. If it's 75% complete, at time T, you have 25% remaining. So natural log of 25, assuming you started with 100%. So you started with all of it, and now we're down to 25% remaining. And that is equal to a negative K, which is 3.0 times 10 to the minus 3, and that's units of 1 over seconds, times the time. And if you did all the work from there, natural log of 0.25, and then divide by negative 3 times 10 to minus 3, you would get the time of 462 seconds as well. So that is how you would work that if you did not recognize it as two half-lives. So you might say, well, okay, that's great. I'm not going to do it that way. I recognize it, so I don't need to know this equation. Well, unfortunately, you will, okay? Because what if the question said, what time is required for the reaction to be 30% complete? We haven't even made it to one half-life. It's definitely going to be shorter than this amount of time because half complete was 231. It says I want to know when it is 30% complete. So we will take the, for this problem, the natural log. Well, 30% complete, we don't put how much reacted. We how, put how much is remaining. So if we started with all of it and we are 30% complete, there's 70% remaining. So that's what I would use in this value here, is equal to a negative 3 times 10 to the minus 2, 1 over seconds, times time. So then we can solve for our time, and when we solve for time in this problem, we end up with 119 seconds. Let's quickly talk through it. I take the natural log of 0.7, I divide by 3 times 10 to the minus 2, and I get 119 seconds. And then I ask myself, does that make sense? Well, I'm less than a half-life. One half-life, using up 50%, would be 231 seconds. So I would expect it to be less than that. Okay, so we've done it for first order. We need to do it for second order and zeroth order next.